Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about using new technologies to expand treatment and recovery services. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Jeremiah Gardner, Public Advocacy and Media Relations and Communications Professional, Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation, Center City, Minnesota. Jonathan Linkus, Chief Executive Officer, American Telemedicine Association, Washington, D.C. Dr. Lisa Marsh, Director, Center for Technology and Behavioral Health, Dartmouth Psychiatric Research Center, Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire. Dr. Clark, let's first talk about the dimensions of digital, digital technology. What is, define for us digital technology. Well, a digital technology basically for your audience is uh, relying on uh, electronic media like the internet, uh, using uh, technological innovations from uh, smartphones to, to computers uh, to exchange information and to uh, promote greater awareness of, of that information. And it also, I suspect, engages uh, the whole realm of um, digital records for patients so that the transfer of information In then becomes more uh, accessible. Indeed, we digital technology does include electronic health records, sharing information through health information exchanges, uh, as well as websites and uh, online communities, uh, as well as uh, what they call these days big data, uh, allowing information to be synthesized uh, that address various issues. Very good, John. Let's move on to the importance of this whole digital realm. Uh, how important is digital medicine uh, to the United States and, and to the world? Well, I, I think it, it holds a promise of really transforming the way we deliver care. A and we like to think that it, it, it provides three different aspects. One, it, in it increases access to care to people who can't get out of their homes or maybe can't travel the distances allows the, the provider to go further distances. It can improve quality of care because you can now get access to professionals that you couldn't get before. And, and then finally, it can reduce the cost of care. Obviously, you're talking about reduced cost of transportation, but also if you can get care on a more frequent basis, it can avoid things uh, that could be much more complicated later on. Very good. And, and Lisa, what are some of the important dimensions of digital health care? I'm sure Dr. Clark um, enumerated some of them, but as it particularly deals with the area of behavioral health care. I think one exciting aspect of technology is the um, unprecedented level of tailoring that you can achieve with these tools. Such as? So, for example, if you're developing a tool for someone in recovery from substance use or someone with active psychosis or a prevention program, skills training program for children or adolescents, you can develop tools in a way that really um, brings value to that end user and can um, add utility as they move through their daily lives, I think. And so we've been very excited in the work that we've seen in the research field that you can really achieve meaningful outcomes for all kinds of different target populations in a wide array of contexts. Very good. Jeremiah, uh, we do know that there's a mental there's a mental health and substance use disorder treatment gap. How do you think that these new technologies will address that that gap? Well, if if by gap we're, we're talking about the the fact that only 10% of people who need treatment um, seek it out and get it, it can do wonders. I, I think one of the things that is uh, you got to think about why do people not seek treatment. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. One is cost. One is um, not recognizing the problem uh, or coming to grips with the problem. Um, getting treatment or getting help is a long decision for a lot of people. Um, they start thinking about it, and, but they maybe don't make that decision for a long time. Digital health, like a, one of the things I work with is our peer, peer support network that the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation provides. And that allows people to kind of tiptoe into the, the notion of thinking about 
do I have a problem? Um, what sort of help might be available? And how so? Can you give some descriptions of that? how that happens? Well, sure. So uh, our online recovery community is available to the whole world. It's free. Uh, it's, it's available 24-7. And so, um, and I manage that day to day. And so I see people every day who come in and, and uh, are struggling. They're at, at maybe at the getting close to their rock bottom, so to speak, and they just reach out for help. Um, and because it's online and it's anonymous, sometimes mm -hmm. that's so much easier to do than it, to walk into an AA meeting or, or especially uh, much easier than walking into a treatment center. Very good. Dr. Clark, that brings up a whole issue of client participation and retention. Uh, these are critical issues in, in, in traditional, let's call traditional treatment settings. Um, how will innovative technologies help with client retention and innovation? I think the point that both Jonathan and Jeremiah mentioned in that is making uh, treatment accessible. Uh, and as Jeremiah's point uh, was, that what you want to do is give that person an opportunity to try it out. Uh, and it's less, less, a lot less intimidating when you can try it out online as opposed to you know, driving 10 miles and going through the receptionists and sitting in the group. So uh, the objective is to make the uh, treatment environment accessible, make the treatment environment inviting, and it allows when you have multiple sites, the person to shop around to find the site that's most amenable to their issues. And as Lisa pointed out, using these technologies, uh, allowing professionals and peers, professionals and peers, to figure out how to offer colleagues or those in, uh, consumers in need of assistance the kinds of services that they, they need. Very good. So, John, what are some of the major ways that technology innovation can improve treatment and recovery uh, specifically? Well, I, you know, there, there's so much change going on right now, and so the applications that we see uh, today are much different than they used to be. I mean, you can use mobile phones uh, to go directly to people no matter where they are. And, and that is a really an amazing thing that, that's happened, the number of applications uh, that are available specifically in the mental health and, and recovery uh, areas uh, are just uh, multiplying. And, and, and so it, it's becoming much more ubiquitous uh, in its availability and also, uh, as, Dr. Clark, as Dr. Clark mentioned, it, it, it can become much more available to people who can try it out. And so the, the technology is interactive. Uh, it can be, you know, where you can use it to, to talk to a therapist or talk to a clinician, or it can be such that, that's iterative that you can use it to keep track yourself in and, a and, and more self-help basis. And Lisa and John both, and you, you can both address this. Is there a, already a comprehensive model that exists for technology applications in behavioral health care? Well, I think that um, we're learning quite a lot about, about this space, and I think there's very clear evidence that if you develop these tools well, and the development piece is really key, and I, I think we don't want to um, diminish the importance of that, because how you develop these tools and in, in collaboration with the end user and making sure you create something that really brings value to the end user end user hugely impacts the outcome of these tools. But if you develop these tools well, we see that they can, they are highly acceptable, they're useful, they can um, improve functioning and outcomes for individuals, they can increase the quality of service delivery, they can be cost effective, um, they can increase service capacity, they can reach folks in rural communities, even the most disadvantaged and vulnerable populations we see can tremendously benefit from these tools. Very good. John, I'm coming back to you for the generational questions. <laughs> Obviously, the young people that are in need of behavioral health uh, care will gravitate immediately to these services. As we move on generationally, uh, what are the prospects of adoption? Oh, I, I think seniors are the fastest growing adopters of the internet and computers, have been for quite some time. Uh, I think the old question of uh, just because you're older you won't adopt the technology is proven time and time again not true. They're a late adopter because they like to make sure it's proven and they like to make sure it's from a, a verified source. But seniors have been using cell phones, digital phones, 
the internet chat lines for many years. And as we move forward and more of the baby boomers, the folks of maybe my generation is getting older, uh, you're going to see this pick up quite a bit. And, and, and it can really help overcome the isolation that many seniors feel in their own homes. Very good. Dr. Clark, so conceivably, I, as a senior person, not that I'm getting into the deep end of the senior, <laughs> but I could potentially get my behavioral health, I could check my pulses for my cardiovascular issues, I could do a whole realm of, of health care services just if I uh, chose to, to get one of these smartphones. Well, we want to make it clear that, the, as uh, Jonathan pointed out, the new technologies are offering a range of things. So biometric information can be uh, achieved through smartphones, but the linkages have to be appropriate and have to be well established. Some of these things are evolutionary, and as uh, he pointed out, uh, seniors tend to be legitimately more cautious just because it's uh, on the stage today doesn't mean it works and doesn't mean it's going to be on the stage tomorrow. So. Uh, as a result, the federal government is looking at it through the FDA into monitoring and regulating uh, some of these applications because we want to make sure that what is promised actually delivers or what it says it's going to do. So uh, the biometric capabilities are great. Uh, we've got uh, technologies that monitor how you move, monitor your pulse, monitor um, uh, whether you, how you sleep. So there are tremendous opportunities available, uh, GPS, where, you are, how, where you're located. Um, that may help uh, senior citizens who are having memory problems. Um, so the promise for seniors as well as for uh, people in the various uh, uh, generational cohorts uh, address some of the behavioral health issues in terms of access. Very good, and when we come back, we'll continue to talk about access issues, prevention issues, and other behavioral health care services uh, innovations in this area. We'll be right back. Technology is also a, a huge and growing area around the management of records. So to the extent that we want behavioral health co conditions to be treated just like any other health condition, then we want caregivers to know what kind of issue a person is dealing with and what kind of medication-assisted treatment they may be on or what kind of psychotropic medication or antidepressants they may be on. Those may have implications for other medications that they may be being prescribed. Uh, sometimes test results are really important, lab results, and technology has become a way through what we call electronic health records to make sure that every caregiver has access immediately to that kind of integrated care so they can provide the best uh, both physical and behavioral health care for the individual in front of them. We do ourselves a disservice to not engage the benefit of technology. Uh, in geographically remote areas where clinicians are not present, having telebehavioral health is an assistance. It allows the community to have services that they would not ordinarily have. So that obviously is an asset for the person who's suffering the crisis and an asset for the community in which that person lives. So technology is not a panacea, but it enhances our ability to get care to support recovery, to communicate with people who uh, share similar concerns, and to get answers to critical questions. For those with mental or substance use disorders, what does recovery look like? It's a transformation. It's a supporting hand. It's new beginnings. When does recovery start? It starts when you ask for help and support. Join the Voices for Recovery. Speak up. Reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I think the neatest thing that technology is providing is it's providing community and it's providing people with access to others 24-7 no matter where you are at. And so, you know, Hazelden's social community, which I, I, I manage, is uh, available to anybody. 
in anywhere in the world in any time of day or night and you're going to I guarantee you, if you go there and you say you're struggling, you are going to get an outpouring of support from people who've been there and, and who can help you uh, with those initial stages. And that's just amazing. That, Ten years ago, that didn't exist. And we're just one of many uh, on, the, on the World Wide Web places where you can find that sort of support. And so I see a new dawn sort of, of people, more and more people being able to access um, community, access other people and when needed, use that as a, a foray to get a professional help also. Lisa, I'm coming back to you to talk about the whole area of prevention. What have we learned in terms of innovations that work in the prevention area for substance and mental disorders? So there's been a lot of exciting research uh, focused on developing and evaluating various prevention tools for lots of different populations, children, adolescents are among them, focused on building up protective factors and reducing risk factors for substance use and later other risk behavior. And some of these are, some of these are interactive games and tools that can be used in classroom settings, but also through other distribution channels. And the data show, again, if you develop these tools well, you can get terrific outcomes. You can get outcomes to what you achieve with prevention curricula delivered by highly trained educators. But what we know is that there aren't enough highly trained educators uh, to meet the needs for our nation. And so really these are tools that can expand the impact of prevention programming. So let's talk, let's, let's expand on that so that our audience, if someone is interested in pursuing one of these uh, new technologies, they can do so. Who is the uh, average user or, or the one that is trained? Who are they? Are they teachers? Is it faith-based? Is it what sector of society is, is using these tools? Well, I think that these can be used in a wide array of contexts, so you could surely um, use them in school settings. We're seeing growing interest in healthcare systems, like pediatricians' offices, for example, in offering these tools. Um, and then there are lots of opportunities for direct-to-consumer models online, embedding them in social media, for example, where youth live, and really, you know, harnessing that and taking advantage of that opportunity to deliver tools that can focus on health and wellness. So if someone, not giving any product name, but if someone wants wanted to look up uh, uh, a system that may be used in their home. They would, they would uh, look up uh, interactive games, prevention. There are many tools out there, and I think sometimes it's hard for folks to know which ones work and which ones don't work. And there are some resources available to help decision making around that. The U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, for example, has great resources the National Institute on Drug Abuse and National Institute of Mental Health. Um, our research center, the Center for Technology and Behavioral Health, has a website which has a centralized toolkit um, reviewing in very uh, brief language the evidence base behind various behavioral health tools. Very good, because you've mentioned evidence base, which is very key for consumers to be aware of. Jeremiah, you are in recovery yourself. Let's talk a little bit about did you have these technologies when you were in, middle, in the middle of your crisis? And if not, tell us a little bit of what you went through versus what you would go through today using some of these technologies. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I've been in recovery for just about eight years, um, eight years on September 25th, actually. And uh, I went to treatment in Minnesota, and not at Hazelden, but at a, at a, a Minnesota model-based treatment facility. And when I got done with treatment, my 30 days, I uh, went back to work, went back home, and, and that was pretty much it. I had a couple aftercare sessions, but there weren't any tools really to engage me. I would go to AA, um, but that was about it. And one of the things we know for sure is that tr you know, recovery doesn't happen in the treatment center. It happens in the community. It really begins in the treatment center. And so today, if I were to go through treatment today, like at Hazelden, at Betty Ford, one of our facilities, for example, um, we'd get a whole host of, uh, I'd get a whole host of resources, including I'd be, uh, I'd take an assessment before I left treatment that would allow, uh, give me a customized version of what we call our My Ongoing Recovery Experience. It's more, it's a web and phone based support system where people get uh, customized, seven customized modules that they go through over 18 months um, that are all rooted in evidence based practices, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, and, and 12 step facilitation. And they get phone support from coaches who actually call them. Um, two to three times in those first 18 months and they can based on their interaction with the web portion of it They can trigger additional calls from the from the coaches 
So that would be one thing that somebody who went through treatment today could get at Hazel and Betty Ford anyway. We also have, uh, we have almost 20 mobile apps that are available, not just to our patients, but to anybody in the world. Uh, one of them, you know, won a White House Patient Empowerment Challenge Award last year uh, that we're real proud of. And, and those apps allow you to do all sorts of things right at your fingertips. Um, you get meditations and, and sort of lessons to, to work through each day. You can uh, track your mood and what things you're dealing with. We call them power-ups and obstacles. So power-ups are things that are happening positively in your uh, recovery. Obstacles are just what, what it means but it tracks it day to day. So you can enter what's going on to your day to day and then get feedback over time. Um, so those are just a couple of examples of stuff that I didn't have when I went through treatment that, that we, w we can have today. Very good. Dr. Clark, following that, specifically as we look at peer support, are there any new innovations that will be uh, targeting uh, or facilitating a dialogue among peers? Indeed, there are. Um software packages and apps uh, oriented toward peers to facilitate peer support. Uh, as Jeremiah pointed out, the whole objective is to uh, create a greater reach because there are uh, situations both in terms of mental health issues like depression and anxiety that people like to know that the people with whom they're communicating, they have an understanding of what they're going through. So uh, different apps are, are targeted toward peers and there are innovations associated with that so that you can facilitate uh, uh, discussions and some of the apps also facilitate uh, uh, information about various peer support meetings, face-to-face -face meetings. It's not just online uh, discussions, but uh, some of the apps attempt to keep current uh, either 12-step meetings or other t types of peer support meetings where people can go uh, and they can use their smartphone uh, depending on where they are, whether it's their home community or visiting community, and find a peer support face-to-face -face meeting. So you have both, you're using uh, technology both to facilitate online discussions, so you have geographic reach and specialty reach, as well as face-to-face -face encounters, so that uh, you're never uh, beyond the reach of, uh, of uh, the technology. Very good, Lisa, and what Dr. Clark has just described is real, it's a, uh, more of a client-based, uh, self-motivated uh, uh, action. What happens when an individual, talk to me about, are there tools for um, counselors or others to use to monitor clients between sessions who may not be as willing to be engaged with this technology? So I think these tools can be used in a very flexible way. So you can have tools that, uh, you know, folks self-initiate use of these tools, and we find that that is very meaningful. You know, 2 a.m. on a Saturday night, you might feel at risk of relapsing, and you have something right there available to you that might help you successfully get through that. But you can also use these tools in a way that they interface with systems of care. They can, you can have clinicians um, set up ways to prompt folks to use it, to see what they're doing, to integrate into, into their service delivery model model, what folks are also doing with these technology-based therapeutic tools. So I think there are lots of different models of deployment, and um, which can include the clinician for sure. Very good. Let's get back to electronic health records. Uh, Dr. Clark mentioned them before. Uh, and John, how does the transition to electronic health records support the integration of beha behavioral health care with primary care? Talk a little bit about that. I think we've been a slow adopter of electronic health records, but they've been a great facilitator as we move ahead because for a, a number of reasons. Um, you know, one of the things that, that is true in not only in recovery but in so many other areas is, is comorbidities, so that we, we have individuals who maybe uh, are suffering from a chronic disease and have depression as related to it. And so it's really important to have the records that can pull together all of the information about a client or a patient or a consumer, whatever you want to call them, uh, and, and have them all in one place and communicate it. The other one is using the technology, which are tools. I mean, we're talking about tools here. We're not talking about a new way of, of, of providing mental health. We're just saying this is a new way of delivering it. In many cases with this, you may be talking about more than one provider over time. 
And it's very, very important to have that chain of information that goes from one person to another and is easily uh, accessed. And so the electronic medical records, when we finally get it and it's really actually interoperable, can be a huge asset for the deployment of these types of digital care uh, tools. And Dr. Clark, in about a minute, tell me, how is SAMHSA facilitating the use of these electronic health records in behavioral health? Well, uh, SAMHSA is working with the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology, working with uh, provider organizations and state authorities to help facilitate the adoption of electronic health records. We're using uh, our grant uh, portfolio to incentivize uh, providers in the community. We're working with uh, the National Association of Drug and Alcohol uh, State Directors so that uh, they incentivize the providers in their community. We're working with the mental health directors so they do likewise because as uh, Jonathan pointed out, the behavioral health community ha has lagged behind the traditional physical health uh, community uh, in the adoption of electronic health records. But if we want to integrate physical health and behavioral health, we need to make sure that there can be a seamless exchange of information where appropriate uh, between both communities. And so working with ONC, we're also working with CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, to uh, promote the, uh, the interest and electronic health records. So uh, we think with our limited portfolio, we're doing quite a bit to stimulate interest in electronic health records as well as interest in health information technology writ large. And adoption. And when we come back, we'll continue to talk about privacy issues uh, related to all of these new technologies. We'll be right back. By facing our mental and substance use disorders, recovery begins, and we are empowered to speak our truth. Join the voices for recovery. Speak up. Reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Technotherapy is about transforming the relationship between uh, people and their healthcare providers. And we see that the key to that is providing really high quality training to healthcare providers on how the use of mobile and web changes the relationship with their clients. Uh, it's a kind of a complicated new world out there, and uh, especially healthcare providers that deal with a lot of regulations and complexity. Uh, they want a way to really understand how does this change what I'm going to do. And so that's, that's really what our training's around. And it ties into essentially clinical psychology, really understanding how w it changes the dynamics between uh, the provider and the client when, when you have a, a mobile or web device keeping you in communication. Virtual World Program is um, more or less exactly what it sounds like. It is a virtual world online program that we use for group counseling to help individuals with substance abuse problems to sort of, again, make those changes, learn about various substance use issues and those kinds of things. We can choose how we want our avatars to represent ourselves. We can choose from a variety of different clothing options and hairstyles how we want to be represented. And then we interact with each other in real time in these different virtual environments. So we can um, speak with each other using voice software, we can text chat, we can walk, we can run, we can fly, we can sit down. We hold our treatment sessions in the same way that we would if we were face to face. Where before they would have to find transportation, have to find gas money, they would have to inconvenience family members to drive them. 
they, weather issues might prevent them to come to treatment. This removes those barriers for the clients to attend treatment. Clients seem to be a lot more open, um, which is also feedback we've gotten directly from them that they just feel more comfortable talking about what's going on in their lives and what problems they're having. Um, and they mostly say that it's largely because they are anonymous and it's not like they have to look these people in the face and worry about being judged directly. They've also really talked about how convenient it is for them. They don't have to worry about getting stuck in traffic. They don't have to worry about finding childcare, all of those kinds of things because they can just sit in their living room or sit in their bed and log in and be in counseling sessions. It takes about an hour to an hour and a half to train a counselor how to nav navigate, run, walk, jump, talk, use the software. He just sort of walked me through the process of how to move around, how to get to the different rooms within the virtual world, um, how to talk to people both voice to voice and with the texting options, how to do the private messages, um, sort of all the things that I needed to know in order to do the counseling. Before we started this virtual world program, we surveyed our clients to see whether they even had internet access at home or whether they had computers. And we found that the vast majority of our clients do have computers at home or at least internet access at home. For clients who don't have computers, the state has provided each agency with 25 laptops that are given to the client. The client gets to keep the laptop when they complete treatment. We've heard from other treatment providers that they have heard clients come in off the street and say, I've heard about the Avatar program, I've heard about the virtual world program, I really want to know if I can participate in it. So word is getting out that we are providing this virtual world program. I am very much so part of the technology generation, so I am always in favor of expanding technology into new areas, so I was a huge fan from the moment they first mentioned it to me. As a program, I don't think it's any better than traditional therapy, um, but it does meet a different need. John, I'm going to come back to you on the issue of privacy. I know you represent the industry, but were you, if you were a consumer, what would you be concerned about? I would make sure that the application that I'm using, that I'm accessing, uh, has followed the guidelines, the federal guidelines uh, for privacy, HIPAA. Uh, and that means uh, encrypting the data, uh, and that means uh, taking some of the information that's there and, and making sure that others don't see it. You know, there's been a lot of discussion of privacy. Uh, it's what I call the, the Lawyer Full Employment Act, because there's a, <laughs> lot of, there's a lot of legal wrangling over it. But the reality is uh, it, it's, it's a problem that can be easily solved with a lot of the technologies we have in place. It's a problem that's been solved many years ago for banking. I mean, we can use an ATM anywhere in the world without too much fear. I mean, there could be some, but for the most part, without fear that we can use this. Uh, and, and so the same thing can be done with all sorts of, of digital medicine, uh, using the encryption, making sure that the data is, is kept safe. Uh, and the biggest issue often is not so much the transmission of the information, it's the patient and where they're located or the clinician and where they're located and who might be walking by and looking at the monitor as they go by. So interestingly enough, I think the digital transmission of the information is probably the least of the problems in terms of uh, maintaining privacy. But even so, even <laughs> so, what should I as a consumer do in order to safeguard my privacy with my physician with my counselor or with everyone else? What steps should I take? You need to make sure that whoever you're dealing with has used the information wisely and is following the guidelines so that they are compliant with the HIPAA regulations, with so the federal privacy So we ask the questions of how do you encrypt, how do you keep my information safe? Is that a... a I, I think you need to make sure that they encrypt. Uh, a lot, for a lot of consumers, I mean, how they encrypt is getting into a technical world that they may That's not correct. know about. But at least they need to know that the provider is very aware of this and has taken very positive steps to, to, to secure the information. Not only is this being transmitted, but also the records after the, this happens to, to be occurring. There are online... Uh, services that deal with the issue of privacy and confidentiality. One of the things you want to know, as Jonathan was pointing out, is you want to see up front the privacy and confidentiality policy of the particular app, 
the electronic health record, the clinic, the physician, the hospital. You want that information posted up front so that you can evaluate Absolutely. it from the beginning. And once you get that information, if you have any concerns, there are privacy organizations that will work with you on interpreting the language because, of course, as we know, from a lot of things that we get online, uh, the small print uh, and the verbiage can be uh, inscrutable. But before you engage, you have that information, you sort through it, you talk to someone who is knowledgeable about it. Uh, you could even search online these days using search engines, uh, whether there are any complaints about the particular application or particular entity that is soliciting your information so that you have a better sense of the security. It's both privacy and security, as Jonathan is pointing out. How they store the information is also equally important. And who else has access? Redisclosure of the information. I can hold that information to close to my heart until somebody else shows up with money, and then I'm throwing out that information. So it is secure, unless, of course, I have a, a back door that I've allowed to be created so I can uh, capitalize off the information. So you want to know whether those things exist. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is, is important. You have HIPAA with regard to general health information and mental health information. You have 42 CFR Part 2, which may or may not apply to substance abuse information. But the key issue is having that declaration by the vendor, by the application, by the provider, so that you can assess upfront before you start disclosing your, your, the information close to you that you view is privileged and uh, personal. Very good. Lisa, let's go back to the application of the technologies. For example, if I wanted to engage someone in cognitive therapy, how would the new technology assist me in that fashion? And explain what cognitive therapy is, if okay. so that people. So I think there, again, th there's flexibility with how this can be done. So you can have distance therapy kinds of models where you have clinicians interacting um, with uh, individuals remotely delivering therapy. You can also have interactive, self-directed tools that folks can go through uh, on their own and that can have content focused on skills training, for example, problem solving skills, how do I make good decisions, how do I set and make progress toward personal goals, how can I manage negative thinking that may be self-defeating, for example. So um, focusing on um, negative cognitions, but also focusing on initiating and maintaining new patterns of behavior that can help with some um, um, behavior health problems. And um, you can develop these and, and use them with all kinds of different audiences for all kinds of different behavioral health considerations. So Jeremiah, if I'm near a place where there are many libations that I should not have access to, mm -hmm. and I'm walking through and I <coughs> see some of my friends sitting there at this establishment, and I have a deep desire and I'm in recovery, and I have a deep desire to go into that place uh, and, and participate in, in the same activities that my friends are participating in. How can the new technologies address that particular urge? Well, I think there's great potential for, as Dr. Uh, Clark was talking about, with wearable biofeedback type of technology where you might get a message on your phone if, if it realizes that you're in proximity to a bar, for example, or if it realizes elevated stress levels or anxiety levels. Uh, there's a lot of potential for that, and I know there's some good studies go going on in that way. But even with some of the stuff that's out there now, um, like some of the apps we have, you can put relapse prevention plans in there where you enter who's your contact um, so that it, with a press of a button, you can send a message to the person that is your support, want, um, re support resource in those times. Um, you can enter your relapse plan. So if you do relapse, what do, what do I do? Um, even planning for that to happen sometimes is helpful in both avoiding it and, and also dealing with it if it does happen. So uh, those are a couple things that come to mind. Very good. You can also, there's a GPS feature that there are some applications that allow the linkage of uh, 
pre-identified vulnerable places with your GPS, and it will alert your mm -hmm. counselor, sort of the panic button. Uh, the person is close to that uh, bar with the friends and the libation, and because it's pre-programmed, uh, because in fact, that's where people hang out, uh, immediately the counselor is alerted. The counselor then is able to call back and say, hey, is that where you want to be? Is that where you need to be? Is it possible that you could be someplace else? Can we get you some help? Is there a peer you can talk to before you uh, enter the portal? So uh, it, that is a, another feature that smartphones bring, and that is the GPS, which will tell uh, someone you trust that you're in a vulnerable situation. Very good. And Jeremiah, going back to you, um, the peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, can you describe exactly how Hazelden uses these new technologies to foment peer-to-peer -peer exchanges? Sure. Well, uh, we have a website called Hazelden Social Community that I manage day-to-day, -day, and it's, av again, available to the whole world. We have people from uh, several countries. We, we had an event on there in March that had people from 29 countries come on in a 24-hour period to watch a movie, The Anonymous People. Mm. 5,700 people came from 29 countries, so it's very diverse. It's uh, and people from all different paths of recovery, people that have been in recovery for a long time, people who are just thinking about it for the first time, family members whose uh, you know, spouse or child is struggling, and, and clinicians. So it's kind of this uh, wonderful mishmash of people who have an interest in recovery. Um, and, and it works in a number of different ways. So you, you can get in and you post something in chat that says, hey, I'm having a hard time. Or you can post on a discussion board that says, my daughter relapsed today, um, looking for advice. Or you can go to a live online meeting. Um, we have multiple ones every day that are for rec recovery or for family members, or we have a meeting for co-occurring conditions, um, all sorts of uh, meetings. Um, and so it's amazing to me, I was a skeptic, I'm trained as a counselor, and I was wondering, is this really gonna be helpful to people? Is a community really formed? And um, I can say my experience is that it definitely does. Um, it's a transient population, so we have 300 members, that uh, new members a month approximately. Some will stop and read a few things and go. Uh, maybe they're just thinking about think, you know, their own use. Um, some will, uh, step in just a little bit uh, more and maybe post something. Some will stick around for years. We have a, one discussion thread, for example, that I think is amazing. It's called the Daily Pledge. And uh, literally dozens of people go on every day and ha some have for many years um, to pledge their sobriety for just that day. And in the course of pledging the sobriety, they'll share about what's going on in their life. You know, if their father passed away or if they got a promotion at work. And so people get to know each other remarkably well um, even in a faceless exchange. And uh, I think community has always been a part of recovery since the dawn of, um, of, the, of this country. And so the internet and social media has really made the possibility of recovery communities infinitely more possible and accessible. Um, Very and good. that's amazing. And when we come back, we'll continue to talk about some of these new technologies and how they impact mental and substance use disorders. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. At times, the path to recovery from a mental and substance use disorder may be unclear. But laying a strong foundation with the support of others makes all the difference. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So ATARI stands for Appalachian Technology Assisted Recovery Innovations, and that is our grant from SAMHSA. We have been working with the University of Wisconsin and provide um, their HS app. And we also provided um, smartphones and six months of service, unlimited talk, text, and data. The staff here, they helped me get it set up. They helped me, they showed me how to use it. It was 
very easy after they got it set up for me. It was really easy. When I wake up to start my day, I do the daily check-in and I read the thought for the day and it helps me get started. One of the big things about me with the app was posting walk and dry places at nighttime. And you would be amazed at some of the comments I was getting on them. Like, I needed to hear this today so bad, it helped me so much. That helped me because that was my way of working with others. You know, some people who have graduated, they're not here anymore, but we've been able to connect people who are in recovery now, who are going through our program, to those people who've graduated the program. The statistics of the app, 83% of the people have stayed sober using it and 90% of them continue to come back to us for services. We're able to see clients' progress, and we actually have progress reports that are reported out and, and generated. Another thing that happens is when a client answers a survey, the technology is enabled to email the counselor if there's a concern that's addressed on the app. So we also have protective factors in place. It's really helpful for people in like the southern parts of West Virginia where they don't have recovery houses like this. Technology is gonna play a major role in how it influences people and their support and communication. And I just, I think that it's something that needs to be implemented more into treatment. And, and one thing I know about this disease is the disease is with the client 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not, you know, I wish we could put it in a box and say, okay, during that clinical session, we're gonna deal with it, and then you're gonna go home and we'll leave it here till next week. But the reality is, it's there all the time, and we have to be able to do it in a practical stance. Addiction doesn't sleep, and so um, helping clients be able to access uh, resources, um, peer support 24-7, that's been, I think, the real value um, of being able to provide the phone and the service and the apps. It's nice to see that people do get better. Rising and falling up the belly. And it's nice to see people that you've known for years out there doing the same thing that you're doing and they're actually have found happiness in their life and they're actually, you know, raising the family that they should be and being the person that we all should be in society. Dr. Clark, let's talk a little bit about workforce issues. How can we promote the use of these technologies and what needs to happen within the field to adopt these technologies? Well, one of the most important things is getting uh, clinicians in the community to recognize the utility of the new technologies as we uh, approach uh, the clinical care and our interactions with the consumers who present to us. So there's a group called Technotherapy and what they've been doing is trying to educate community providers about the psychology of cyberspace, about how perceptions are changed and altered, and about uh, a number of the psychological dynamics associated with being online and uh, how important it is for the workforce to understand those issues because when you interacting with your client, with your patient, and you need to be asking about their online experiences because it, it does color how they respond to various issues and various interventions. Interventions. So that, I think, is, is an important thing. We need to make sure that we're diffusing this information. And SAMHSA has a, a portfolio where we're trying to promote that so people understand that uh, a new environment requires a new way of looking at things so that we can enhance our effectiveness. And John, what is the best way of people to find out what is being used and how it's being used? Well, there's so much going on. Um, within the American Telemedicine Association, we have a major chapter dealing with mental health, telemental health issues. We have members who are providers from all over the world. We estimate uh, a couple of years ago, about 300,000 patients were getting some help online uh, using mental health. Today, I'm sure that number is exponentially larger. Uh, and, and I think it's also important to point out that we talk a lot about direct-to-consumer mental health, and that's the latest thing. But mental health care using uh, digital health or remote telemental health has been active for many, many years. In most of the prison systems around the country, they are very actively using uh, telemental health activities uh, all over the place. Uh, increasing and how are they using it, John? Well, obviously, when, when you're a prisoner, you're, you're not able to get out to go visit a doctor, and not many doctors are willing to go in and make a visit. 
And so many of the prison systems, particularly the state prison systems and increasingly the federal prison system, uh, are using telemedicine or networked applications that allow a prisoner to see a therapist or another physician uh, remotely from their own uh, facility. Uh, maybe not as popular for the prisoners because they don't get to go out to see the, do the doctor, but it does increase access. So that's certainly being used. In the courts, using commitment hearings, for example, uh, that's increasingly being used for uh, using telemental health for uh, particularly after hours if you have to have that. Uh, many, many uh, hospitals are starting to outsource uh, using telemedicine to specialists, so, so there's a lot of specialty services. And of course, as we said, consumer, direct-to-consumer services, Jeremiah has been talking about at Hazleton. There's a number of, uh, of online uh, consumer health services that are now popping up, and we think that's going to be a, a, major, uh, a major source of support in the future. Very good. And Jeremiah, speaking of the services that Hazleton, is there an opportunity for service providers to tailor these services to specific groups such as the military and the veterans? Yeah, one of the realities we're facing in this country obviously is this growing number of people coming back from these wars that we've had for several years with mental health issues like post-traumatic stress and often co-occurring uh, substance use issues. And, and so we've taken our, and I'm proud to say that we can help them. Uh, we have on our, our peer support community a co-occurring conditions meeting that is uh, actually chaired by somebody from the VA, a peer support specialist. And um, uh, I think that's a fantastic thing that we can provide for free to veterans anywhere, right, not just veterans, but people who are in the military now. We also have customized our My Ongoing Recovery Experience MORE program. Uh, that phone What and does wh the MORE program stand for? My Ongoing Recovery Experience. My Ongoing Recovery yeah, Experience. It's, that, it's the web and phone-based support system that we have. And, We've tailored that for the Navy, so we have a program called Navy More that allows people who uh, are at sea to access our, our interactive modules and our, our coaches' phone support and, and online meetings. And so, you know, once or twice a week, I'll log on to our community and I'll see a couple dozen people from Okinawa <laughs> that, that log in, and that's, that's really cool. And Lisa, where is the research? These are all wonderful innovations, but where is the research going with all of these new technologies? Are we bound to see even better and more tailored approaches? So there's a lot of exciting research happening and a lot of learning that's coming out of that, not only about how to best develop these tools for lots of different audiences in lots of different contexts, but also about different models of integration of these tools into healthcare systems. And so what we see generally if, is if you have tools that are developed well and you add them on to uh, traditional models of care, you often get better patient outcomes, better quality of, of care and cost effectiveness. What we also see is that some systems of care are trying out models where they're offloading some of their service delivery to technology-based tools. So the idea is having this integrated technology-assisted care model. And one benefit of that is that some folks have um, prioritized is the, an increase in service capacity. So with the same number of clinician resources, you can have a much uh, larger base of, of individuals that you serve and or might free up uh, some time of clinicians to deal with folks in crisis or who have particular needs. We also see models that are sort of standalone um, technology delivered interventions. And in some settings, that's really meaningful. Like we've spoken about and Jonathan's spoken about in rural settings where the access is very mm -hmm. limited. In criminal justice settings, you know, we've worked also in criminal justice settings where the resources for behavioral health are very limited and the need is immensely, it's enormously high. And so th there might be models there where you, you have this as a standalone system that can bring value. And then I think finally a, a growing and exciting area of research is the integration of technology-based behavioral health tools into primary care and really centrally leveraging technology to promote integrated care in settings where behavioral health expertise may be limited, but where we know behavioral health hugely impacts the full spectrum of health and wellness including uh, preventative health and chronic disease management. So that integrated model, I think, can bring value at, at many levels. Very good. And John, I'm going to go back to you and ask you a very uh, direct question that I'm sure you can answer because you, you help to, to respond to that. What are some of the barriers that people will face in using these technologies? Well, of, of course, with any new technology, adoption 
uh, is always goes out to the early adopters first, and those are the ones that are comfortable with the technology. So part of it is making sure that the human factors associated with the technology is taken into account, and so that people can easily access it. It's not a, a, a something to jump over. So that's certainly one of the areas, just from a consumer point of view. Uh, from a, a professional point of view, well, most professionals that I know of would like to get paid for their services. And so uh, we, we, we are moving ahead, but slowly moving ahead on reimbursement uh, in healthcare for uh, uh, mental health, telemental health services. Uh, I think the private payers are further ahead, Medicaid, many states are moving that way, uh, and the federal is moving that way as well. So we still have ways to go, but, but we're getting there. All right, well, let's go to our round robin of short answers. What do you see in the future and what are your last thoughts? Well, I think it's the last 10 years, social media and the internet and technology has transformed every aspect of society and is continuing to do so. So I think to think it's not gonna affect what we do in treatment and recovery services is, is uh, would be absurd to think that. So it's a matter of not waiting for it and, uh, and, and going after it. And so as a lead, leader in the industry, that's what we're trying to do. Very good, Lisa. So as a research scientist, you know, I've been so struck by the data that we repeatedly see that these tools can really bring value in, at so many levels and so many different settings. And I think that there's a real opportunity in the future as this, as this work evolves to really take advantage of what technology can do. And that is, we have a lot of terrific tools that focus on, on various behavioral health issues, but a lot of siloed tools. And we know there are so many behavioral health issues as well as you know physical health conditions that cluster together. And I think we can use technology to have an integrated suite of tools that are optimally responsive to whatever profile of needs and preferences people present with. Very good. John. Well, you know, I think the biggest factor that's going to drive this in the future is consumers. Uh, every study that we have ever done uh, or that I've seen on remote digital health care has shown that consumers, the patients, love it. Uh, I, I haven't seen a study where they don't really like it. And so what's happening now is people are starting to demand it, saying, why don't I have access to health care? So I think that's what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Very good, Dr. Clark. Workforce, making sure that as technotherapy is trying to do, making sure that we have a workforce that is sophisticated in the use of health information technology and the impact of uh, social media on individuals, their access to uh, social media, and making sure that consumers uh, make the proper choices in terms of how they participate, both as a reactive, uh, in a reactive mode as well as in a therapeutic mode. Very good, and I want to thank you for being here. It's been a wonderful show, and remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. You can go to recoverymonth.gov to get information about how to develop events, uh, connect with your community, and with your policymakers and leaders in your community to talk about recovery for behavioral health issues, both substance use disorders and mental health disorders. Uh, at a very important time that we need to do that now. So I want to thank you for being here. It's been a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.